Hello, George Romanich here. In today's video, we are going to talk about inertial oscillations. A simple concept of particular importance in atmospheric sciences, but even more important in oceanography, as we will see in today's video. What are inertial oscillations? They are type of motion that we get if there is exact balance between centrifugal force and the Coriolis force and all other forces in horizontal direction disappear. Both centrifugal force and the Coriolis force are inertial forces and they cannot change speed of air parcel or, or water parcel. They can only change direction because they cannot do work. They act to the right from the direction of motion. This is also balanced flow because these two forces are in exact balance. To investigate this simple concept, and you will see how simple it is in a few minutes, we will use natural coordinate system. And the concept is actually simple because we are using this coordinate system. If you decide to use some other coordinate system, then the whole problem can get more complicated. But we don't want that, and that's why in the previous video I introduced natural coordinate system. So let's investigate inertial oscillations. So we start this discussion by writing uh, horizontal momentum equations in natural coordinate system, namely dv dt is equal negative delta phi delta s. So I'm writing it in the pressure coordinate system. Phi is geopotential gz. And we have that V squared over R plus FV is equal negative delta phi delta N. Now I will not explain how we get these equations. This is explained in details in my previous video. I will just tell you that this is pressure gradient force in the direction normal to the motion. This is pressure gradient force in the direction of the motion. Coriolis force, centrifugal force, and acceleration. But inertial flow is balanced flow, which means there is no acceleration, which means first equation doesn't exist. Also, inertial flow is balanced between Coriolis force and centrifugal force, and there is no pressure gradient force in the direction normal to the motion. I would assume some of you are rightfully now asking, but how is this even possible? How can we have a flow if there is no pressure gradient force to drive the flow? Because after all, we said that the pressure gradient force is the only force that can initiate motion. And that is correct. So what we assume here implicitly is that at some point in time, in the history of an air parcel, let's say we have an air parcel over here, at some point in time, there was pressure gradient force acting on this parcel of air, and then pressure gradient force ceased to exist, and now this parcel of air is just coasting due to inertia that possesses. And the forces that are affecting that motion are the centrifugal force and Coriolis force. So from this second equation, we can already see that this R, which is radius of curvature, of the trajectory is equal negative v over f. Or, if you want, we can express this in terms of v, and that will be negative rf. And these are really two results that we get for inertial winds or inertial flow. Now, because there is no acceleration, as we said, this velocity v needs to be constant. But that also means r needs to be constant because f is constant and positive in northern hemisphere. So we see everything here is constant and because r is radius of the curvature of the trajectory of this air parcel, we conclude that trajectories will be circles and the radius of the circle will be r. So let's maybe plot that. If we have parcel of air, like so, and these are the only two forces that are acting, then trajectory will be this nice 
circle and radius of the circle is r. Now let's analyze this simple expression a little bit. Well, in northern hemisphere we said f is positive and v has to be positive by definition of our natural coordinate system. Well, that means that uh, r in that case will be negative. How do we get that? But you will remember that we defined unit normal n to be normal to the trajectory, to the path of this parcel of air, but by definition positive to the left. So this is positive unit vector n in natural coordinate system, but look, r is in the opposite direction and therefore this whole thing makes sense. So in the absence of all other forces, namely pressure gradient force and friction, this parcel of air will go forever in this circle. And this circle is called inertial circle. And these oscillations are called inertial oscillations. Why is it called inertial oscillations? Well, I already described it because these two forces are the consequence of inertia of the fluid. Now, this shouldn't be confused with the absolute inertial motion in the universe. Absolute inertial mo motion is the absence of all forces. So if we have, let's say here, if we have a body, a particle, and it just coasts in the straight line forever and ever and ever, then that is absolute inertial motion and there are no forces acting. So an initial velocity was delivered somewhere, let's say, in the outer space far away from all galaxies. This particle will coast forever in the straight line. Now from this figure you can already see that we can easily calculate period of these oscillations and let's call it t. What is period? Period is time that this parcel of air needs to complete one revolution. So that would be, well, circumference of this circle divided by velocity of that pars uh, parcel of air. So that would be in absolute values 2 pi r, that circumference of this circle, over v. And I put absolute because r can be negative. Uh, like in this case over here, or it can be positive, so to cover these both cases. Well, this is further equal, 2 pi r, but what is v? Well, v is rf. I don't need minus, because again, I'm using absolute value, so r and r cancels, and I get that this is 2 pi over absolute f, Again, F can be positive in Northern Hemisphere or negative in Southern Hemisphere, so I count for both using absolute value because period has to end up being positive number. But we know that F is Coriolis parameter, so in absolute terms it is 2 omega absolute sine phi because sine is sensitive to the sine of the angle, so it is appropriate to use absolute value which means we get that this t is equal, well this 2 will cancel with this 2, it's pi over omega absolute sine phi, where phi is a latitude and omega is angular velocity of the earth. But let's analyze now what is this expression telling us. Well, I hope you know from my previous videos, for example video on centrifugal force, that 2 pi over omega is one full day on our beautiful planet. This is period of Earth's rotation. And here we have pi over omega, which means that this t is really pi over omega half a day over absolute sine phi. And this is our result. And this is called one half pendulum day. Or if you are more advanced, perhaps in physics, you will recognize that this is also time period that is required for Foucault pendulum to turn through an angle of 180 degrees. So let's calculate this period, for example, for uh, my city of Montreal. 
So in Montreal, T will be half a day, which is 12 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. This is, mi uh, this is minutes times 60 seconds divided by sine of 45.5 degrees. That is latitude of Montreal. So this is for Montreal. Which means T, if you calculate these numbers, ends up being approximately 16.9 hours, which is basically 17 hours. So this would be period of these inertial oscillations above Montreal. Now, one thing to mention, which is very important, is that it is very rare to find pure inertial oscillations in the atmosphere because pressure gradient force is pretty much always existent and it either initiates motion or governs motion that is already in place. So it is very difficult to isolate pure inertial oscillations. However, it is easier to do it in the oceans because if you have, let's say here, uh, part of the ocean and there is wind, above the ocean and it initiates the motion and then wind stops. Well, that motion continues and it can have significant amount of energy associated with these inertial oscillations. And that's what I will show to you here. Here on the y-axis we have energy content expressed through power spectrum of kinetic energy in the first 30 meter of the ocean near Barbados. And uh, on the x-axis, primary x-axis, we have frequency and on the secondary x-axis, we have period that we, for example, here just calculated for Montreal. Now, this I will not go into details of power spectral analysis. I will have videos on that in the future. But as I said, just imagine that peaks correspond to peaks in energy associated with given frequency. Or associated with given period, because frequency and period are related. We can see that most of the energy is stored in a semi-diurnal tidal motion, which is not unexpected, but there is also peak in energy associated with inertial oscillations. Now, some of you, rightfully so, could say, but the fact that somebody put arrow over here doesn't necessarily mean this is really inertial oscillation. How do you know this is really inertial oscillation and not something else? Well, that's relatively simple to answer. We will calculate, just as I did in the case of Montreal over here, I will now calculate period of inertial oscillations near Barbados, which is 13 degrees north. So let's do it over here. Well, again, we have period is equal 12 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds divided by sine of 13 degrees. And if you plug in these numbers, you will get that this is 2.2 days. So that's the period of inertial oscillations at this latitude. And now if we go back to this figure, you will notice, you will notice that this peak has period of 2.2 days. 2.2 days, 2.2 days. Conclusion, atmospheric science and physics are awesome. These types of comparisons and graphs are something that always makes me excited and I get goosebumps. And that's why I love physics and atmospheric sciences so much. Think about it. You take pen and paper and you calculate something based on purely theoretical model. And then you take a piece of metal and plastics called instrument and you put it somewhere in the atmosphere or the oceans and it shows exactly what you calculated. And that's this graph that we just discussed here. I truly believe that these types of excitements cannot be achieved 
if you study something that is not natural science, such as physics or atmospheric sciences. And therefore, I encourage you to experience what I'm now experiencing and start learning atmospheric sciences. Until next video, goodbye.